All right. Welcome back, uh, everyone. We were in Acts chapter 5, uh, verse 19. So we will pick up from there. But before I go forward, uh, just wanted your inputs on you know whether you're receiving something from this or any feedback so then i can you know tailor the classes as per your requirements is it going okay so far you're able to understand yes it is very wonderful oh praise god thank you thank you brother uh, manohar Glad that you're learning from it. I'm just a little concerned uh, because somehow your class is not asking those many questions anymore in the third year. So uh, whether that's uh, being overwhelmed by you know all this uh, study or if it is just ha having grown in wisdom, you know you don't have those many questions anymore. I don't know. So just checking. Okay, so please feel free at any point you can interrupt and ask questions. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Good to see your responses and see your names uh, here in the chat. Okay, thank you. Lesha, Mangi, Superjit, Susan, Asha. Okay, glad, glad that you're uh, uh, hearing and receiving from this. Okay, Siddharth, thank you so much. Abhishek. Yes. Okay, Abhishek says all questions are answered while you, you are teaching us. Yes, thank you, thank you. So, yes, say so. Just trying to um, you know include the uh, inputs in uh, the explanation itself. But if something is missed out, then feel free, feel free, you can ask. Yes, thank you, Rupa, Christopher, praise God. All right, so let's move on. Uh, the, the book of Acts is uh, you know. Nothing less than exciting uh, at all times. Something or the other is going on that we can uh, learn from, that we can be built up uh, with. So we saw how, again, the authorities have taken note of these believers uh, and them being a threat to the authorities. So what are they going to do? They put them in the prison this time around. The apostles, it says. So Luke records, the apostles were put in the prison. Now, verse 19, how did they escape this time? But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So earlier, they escaped with um, uh, just some threats from the authorities. But this time around, their escape is through the hands of an angel, scripture says, an angel of the Lord, but at night. So, you know, people can interpret this in all possible ways at night, when their darkest moments, in their difficult moments, uh, when there was so much of opposition, God intervenes through an angel. So at the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors. How can an angel do this? We know from scripture, Hebrews 1.14, that angels uh, are supposed to be, um, you know, they're supposed to aid the heirs of salvation. The believers are the heirs of salvation. So their task is... Um, that they are delegated to help or aid uh, the people of God. So in this situation, for rescue, what was the purpose? Rescue of the apostles. God sent an angel and the angel would have been commanded, go and open the prison doors. So the angel does that. Okay, But the angel also carries a message and a mandate and the angel tells these apostles go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life very unusual very unusual instruction from the angel no who in their right minds will go back to the place where they were arrested so let's imagine if i was in the city center and then i was preaching about jesus um, and i got arrested 
I'm in the prison. The angel opens the prison doors and tells me, Nancy, go back to the city center. That wouldn't make any sense. But for the apostles, it would have been an encouragement from heaven where God is saying, no matter what opposition you face, I'm not changing your mandate. You are called, you are chosen, you are appointed to take my good news to the people. No authority uh, on the face of the earth can you know, stop this mandate that God has for his people. So it was a way of God showing the apostles, I am with you, heaven is with you, continue what you are doing. So uh, they would have received great encouragement. Wow, we got rescued. But you see, rescue in this case is not like, oh, okay, you know, uh, now you're out of the prison. Uh, you can do what, go and do whatever you like. But we see that um, God is a God who brings divine rescue, but his, his desire is that people will continue in his mandate. Okay? So it's not for our own, uh, you know, our own, whatever we want to do in life. So every time God will rescue, God will send his angels. We can use the principles of prayer. We can claim, we, we can use faith, do whatever we, we like to do. Use all the spiritual principles uh, just to have, you know, uh, uh, the kind of life that we desire. But in the book of Acts, when we look at the lives of the apostles and the believers, we see that they were truly living for the Great Commission. They were not... As you would see, they were not living for their own whims and fancies. Uh, they're very mission-minded, missional, mission-oriented people. And such people, you will notice that there are interventions, divine interventions after interventions, divine interventions after interventions, because God was assuring them that I am with you as you fulfill the Great Commission. And so... This time around in Acts 5, an angel comes to their rescue. Then verse 21, and when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. Okay, so again, you see the eagerness. Just yesterday evening, the person is arrested or the people are arrested. How would they have the courage to show up in that same spot you know, the next day. And the angel told them, you go back. They could have bargained, okay, angel, we'll go back. You know, give us three days. Very tired now, you know. We need to recover from this trauma of being put in the prison. But you see their enthusiasm, their excitement for the gospel, pro proclamation of the gospel. It says, when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning. So they were excited. They were eager and taught so back to business okay no compromises that is the spirit which the early believers carried but the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of israel and sent to the prison to have them brought so while the apostles are out okay uh, and uh, back to doing what they are called to do by God, um, the human authorities, they are doing what they need to do, which is to prepare uh, for the trial of these 12 apostles. But little do they know that these men have already escaped and they've gone back to the spot where they were originally caught. So the officers, they go, they check up the prison uh, over there. They're not able to find uh, the apostles. They come back and they report it to um, these high priests and that entire team. Uh, and so they, they tell them, you know, uh, verse 23, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Okay, so it, this is miraculous. Now, if you ask the question, angel opened the door is what the earlier scripture says. These people saw the door closed. There were guards standing out. How is it that the guards did not notice the apostles walking out of the prison? I don't know. Okay, I can only say it is miraculous. So it all 
happened and the apostles are not in the prison luke is reporting this uh, and and this is being now this information is being reported to the high priest verse 24 when the high priest the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things they wondered what the outcome would be so they had every right to wonder because their master went missing or at least so uh, you know the disciples have been stating that he rose from the dead and you know all those uh, uh, reports of the disciples so now they are wondering what did these disciples do they have also disappeared from the prison so what's going on with these men you know who are they what is their agenda so there's a lot of uh, uh, you know tension confusion um, and uh, speculation among the authorities so they wondered what the outcome would be verse 25 so one came and told them saying look the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people you know as if uh, the headache was not you know uh, sharp enough it's worse now because you can't understand they these men escaped who escapes and goes back to a place where they can be caught what is wrong with these men right so uh, the authorities are really wondering what do we do okay what do we do what is the agenda of these men verse 26 then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence for they feared the people lest they should be stoned so we read earlier that uh, the apostles gained gain uh, gained great esteem among the people so uh, Obviously, the high priest, the commander, the captain of the temple, all the all these are people, they cannot persecute the apostles in an outright way, okay, in a noticeable way. Otherwise, what will happen? Their political standing, their reputation with the people will go down. Uh, and, and so they didn't want that. So quietly, without violence, quietly they brought them from the from the you know temple area. And uh, uh, verse 27, when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them. So they were able to continue with the interrogation. They had gathered for the interrogation and isn't it strange? Apostles escaped, but they have now again been brought into the interrogation. So what is going to take place now? How will they escape now? You know, they're back in the hands of the authorities. So they uh, are questioned. So the high priest asked them, verse 28, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and indeed to bring this man's blood on us. So there is question, there is accusation. Uh, there is also a compliment. Okay, in what the uh, high priest is saying. So the question is, you remember the last time your men were caught. What did we tell them? We told you, do not strictly, uh, you know, teach in this name. And we told you that, isn't it? So he, they are being questioned um, and because they do not follow the instruction of the authorities. Second, the high priest says, look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Just think about this. It, it's all too funny. You have the uh, great men of the city who are threatened by the unlearned, uh, you know, the untaught the Galileans who don't have any sort of a social standing in the society. But they are threatening. Um, the authorities and high priest is saying you have filled jerusalem with your doctrine in those days no, you don't have social media you have nothing and these 12 men are being accused of filling jerusalem with their doctrine so they had done a fabulous job 
of preaching the name of Jesus. They had done a fabulous job of demonstrating the power and the glory of God in that city that everyone had taken notice. Okay, I'm saying everyone because the high priest is saying you've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. So it was noticeable. The, the, the church cannot hide. The believer cannot hide, no matter what we try to do. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, see, we are called to be salt and light. And you cannot put uh, a lamp under a bushel. right? You cannot put a flame under a bushel. So uh, we are a city on a hill, noticeable. And that is the kind of life that God has given every believer. We are supposed to arise and shine. So the light of the church of Jerusalem, the light of the apostles was shining so powerfully that the high priest captures it as you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. So they had preached Jesus that much. And uh, now is the accusation. He says, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. So he is making an accusation about the intention of the apostles. OK, so that's quite painful. Now, if he were to comment on what the men were doing, which is he said it earlier, we told you not to preach in the name of Jesus. So if he was commenting on their actions, that's easier to handle. But what he's saying is he's questioning their intention and he's accusing them of uh you know inciting um uh, some sort of uh, an uncomfortable um, situation uh, basically he says this man's blood on us you intend to bring this man's blood who is this man this man is the lord jesus okay so he was saying that the apostles after jesus had died they were continuing to create chaos and uh, they somehow wanted um, the authorities to you know, face, uh, face the consequences of crucifying Jesus. All right, so this is what the high priest says. Now, Peter, okay, Peter and the apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So Peter gives an explanation. The explanation is more the gospel being shared with the authorities than a defense. Because what is Peter saying? He is letting the people know that we are going by God's mandate. We ought to obey God rather than men. So there are times when those scriptures tell us, you know, obey your authorities, submit to the authorities. There are times when the authorities go against the purpose of God, when we have to surrender to an authority which is greater than the human authority. Okay, so again, it, this is this is not always. In general, we are called to submit uh, to the authorities that God has put over us, and we read about it. You know, the same Apostle Peter writes about it um, in in his epistles. But in this situation, because they were being forbidden to fulfill the mandate of God, the Great Commission, to not preach in the name of Jesus, Peter knew, hey, I can defy this because they are asking me to do something, um, you know, which is not pleasing in God's sight. So that's why he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then he goes on to describe the, the sermon, short sermon here. He says, God, our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Sounds like an accusation, but not so. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. So what does he say? Jesus is deity, he is God, he is prince, he is already connected to our fathers. So, you know, through 
the Jewish uh, understanding, he's bringing in Jesus into the picture and saying that approved by this God that you serve, Jesus is deity. And he introduces Jesus as what? He says, Savior, Savior. So those whose inner ears were open, their spiritual ears were open, hopefully, we don't know. Okay, we, when Luke does not write about how many became believers after this sermon. But my take is that there must have been some people who responded to this gospel message. So he introduces Jesus as deity, as savior. And he places so wisely, he places a call to repentance in between what he said. He says, savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So while the high priest is accusing the apostles, you want to bring the, uh, uh, you know, this man's blood on us. That is your intention. But what is the real intention of the apostles and a true child of God? That people should come to repentance, you know, move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You must be born again. So that is the intention with which Peter speaks. And this is not so much of a defense as much as it is the sharing of the gospel. So he says, Jesus, he's the savior of Israel. OK, so he brought repentance to Israel, which means he brought repentance to you, high priest. He brought repentance to you, captain of the temple. He brought repentance to you, sect of the Sadducees. So. He's encouraging them to repent, actually. Uh, and they never miss an occasion you know, to speak the truth of Jesus or to demonstrate the power of God. So they take even this occasion of the trial to speak about Jesus and uh, say that he brought repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins. So you have forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, verse 32. And he says, we are witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So he is just saying, look, we are obeying God. You do what you want. Okay, we are not going to stop you from what you uh, feel is right. So it's quite um, funny. Like God made them escape, but he told them to go back and preach. Now they're again stuck. So like what is God's plan? Does is, is he uh, intentional about rescuing his people from persecution? So as we look at the lives of these apostles, what we observe is there are times when they escaped and there are times when they did not escape. Okay, So as you study each one's life, nearly all of them were martyred. And you, know, you might ask the question, God, why didn't you command the angel to uh, go and uh, you know, unlock the prison doors? We don't know. Okay, we don't know. We're going by God's mandate. But one thing we know that even if we get into trouble uh, for righteous reasons of proclaiming the gospel, or uh, if there's martyrdom, okay, we'll see later about the life of Stephen, uh, it's precious in the sight of God. It's precious in the sight of God. And God is with us. Um, the way he encouraged the apostles and said, you go. You preach, okay? Uh, your mandate has not changed. I am with you. I'm sending you heavenly help. So uh, we move with God's help. We move with God's, um, uh, you know, his assurance, uh, his encouragement. Okay, so the apostles are now again caught in the situation. What are they going to do? How are they going to escape? So we see that um, when Peter spoke like this, the authorities became very angry. So verse 33 says, they were furious. They were very angry and plotted to kill them. So the opposition was becoming worse. Earlier, threatened. Now, plotting to kill. Okay, Just like what happened to Jesus. So now, plotting to kill. They are, they are thinking how they can get rid of all these guys. Verse 34. Then one in the council stood up. Pharisee named Gamaliel, the teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. So every now and then this, this uh, team meeting is happening. 
So they have to make space for it. So they say, okay, okay, don't leave them aside. Come on, let's get together. Earlier also, they comfort, they, they came together, they discussed together to see what shall we do about Peter and John. Again, they are meeting together to come up with a good idea and a good plan to deal with these 12 men. And one particular person, Okay, stands up in the crowd. His name is Gamaliel. Who is this Gamaliel? It says he was a teacher, right? Uh, he was a teacher of the law. And he has a wonderful repetition, held in respect by all the people. So he is a, an influential uh, figure in his times, influential enough to instruct the high priest, you know, the sect of the Sadducees, whoever had gathered, and they are willing to listen to him. That really shows us that this person is a great person. Uh, a little bit more about Gamaliel. So Gamaliel was uh, the grandson of an esteemed, um, uh, you know, leader of Israel. Uh, his name was Hillel, and Hillel was the founder of Israel's strongest school of religion. And Gamaliel uh, was given a title known as Rabban, uh, which means our teacher. And you know he was um, he was somebody who had taught uh, men, great men, great Pharisees during his time. And later we will uh, we will see that Apostle Paul was one of the students of Gamaliel. So then it just shows us what kind of training Apostle Paul would have had, uh, you know, uh, as a Pharisee, how he would have kept the law, because his teacher is somebody who is of great reputation also. Okay, so uh, these are all very notable man, uh, men in Jewish uh, history. So Gamaliel suddenly begins to speak. Now, what uh, can God do through uh, the opinion of an unbelieving man of influence. Let's see. So he gives a piece of uh, advice. 35, verse 35. Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. So Gamaliel is advising. And he's saying, for some time ago, uh, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. So <coughs> one might look at uh, what Gamaliel said and think that was Gamaliel a, a believer, or you know, why is what he's saying? Um, give some space, some opportunity, uh, some leeway to the apostles. Because it, he's talking like a fence sitter. He's saying, OK, don't take action right now. Let's wait and watch. But in a way, it was an escape for the apostles, because they, they could get out of this situation uh, through the words of Gamaliel. Okay, So was it God working through Gamaliel? We could say that you know, God has his own ways of working in different situations. And uh, obviously, I don't think Gamaliel was a believer because he did not um, confess Christ or say anything directly uh, you know, about uh, Jesus Christ. But what he said had the wisdom of God in it. So he points to two people, Theodos, uh, one particular uh, gentleman who led others. You know, he led a mob against the, the authorities, and it didn't work. So he said, look, you remember this man, Theodos. 
400 people followed him. But what happened? You know, suddenly um, they all got scattered. His movement came to nothing. So it was useless what Theodos did. And he points to another man called Judas of Galilee. He also perished. And all who obeyed him were dispersed. So he was saying that if these men are like Theodos and Judas, there'll be an uproar. There'll be this excitement in the air about Jesus of Nazareth. But it'll all calm down. Just let it, you know, let it take its own course. Let it die its own natural death. Let's let it be. Don't bother. But he adds something there. Verse 39, he says, But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it lest you even be found to fight against God. So somewhere in his thinking, he probably had questions whether this could be God. What about the miracles? What about the, the signs? What about that lame man? You know, what about these men escaping from the prison? What about that Jesus? We don't know. We don't know what uh, uh, he was thinking and, uh, you know, whether he was searching. We don't know. But he made this statement and said, look, there are two possibilities. What these men are doing is a worldly effort. If it is so, it will die a natural death, just like all the other efforts did. But if this is supernatural, if it is of God, don't be the one standing in the way of the tide. You will drown. Okay, you cannot stop the work of God. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it. Now, we are all uh, witnesses of things that have happened in history. Okay, we, are, we know about uh, times when uh, there, the, there were dark times, when the dark ages where people did not know about uh, God. There were times when truth of scripture, about salvation, about water baptism, about Holy Spirit. All this was hidden. People did not know it. People could not apply it. So there have been times like that that when uh, many forces stopped the work of God, stopped the truth of God. But we also know that nothing that the authorities did could stop what uh, you know, this gospel is about because we're talking about what, you know, uh, times like 67 AD is around when uh, Luke actually wrote uh, this book of Acts. And he described, you know, what happened in uh, like 30 decades, uh, sorry, three decades of uh, um, uh, after Jesus. But today, you know, we are uh, roughly 2000 years after these incidents. And we can tell that what the authorities tried to do in Jerusalem that day and what Gamaliel said, there was wisdom in it because obviously they could not overthrow it. Here we are today you know, on this uh, Google, Google Meet, Google Classroom uh, video call, learning about the same Jesus and his power and his glory. So even earthly authorities over these years have not been able to stop what Gamaliel at that point, you know, he had this inclination. It could be the work of God, lest we be found to fight against God. And we can testify that, hey, Gamaliel, you were right. This is the work of God and it could not be stopped, you know, with the, uh, just with the apostles and their times. Okay, so this was the advice of Gamaliel. Now, thank God for this advice. Now, what happens after that? So now, uh, after their small meeting, group meeting, uh, they call back the apostles. So verse 40, and they agreed with him. Others agreed with him when they had called for the apostles and his scriptures say, and beaten them. Why? Because the authorities are doing their best to intimidate the followers of Jesus. So after they called them, they had beaten them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So threaten to the you know best capacity possible and then send these apostles off. At least they learn a lesson from it and they'll stop 
uh, preaching about Jesus. So verse 41, so they departed from the presence of the council. They were beaten, right? So what? They departed from the presence of the council crying. Is that what the Bible say? It says rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So the council would have been like, give us a break. What is wrong with these people? No, nothing that we are doing is actually affecting them. The first time we saw in Acts 4, when they are threatened, they go back, report it to their uh, friends. And they pray and you, they ask God, God, give us more boldness. Let more signs and wonders be done through the hands of the apostles. Now, second time, they were threatened. You had all the big guys of Jerusalem show up. There's Gamaliel and you know high priests and all. They threatened. They beat them up. What is the effect of that? Verse 41, they departed, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So it's amazing. Okay, I have nothing more to say. It's just amazing uh, the way the early church knew their God. They knew their faith. They had uh, given into the mandate of uh, taking the gospel out. You know, they were committed to the mission. Uh, they were filled with the Spirit. It's awesome. The amazing response uh, that they had the second time that they were uh, threatened. Verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So full whatever was done by the authorities is a big, you know, it wasn't a deterrent. Why? Verse 42, it says daily in the temple. So these people have not stopped doing what they know. And they have that vigor and energy to do it daily. Daily they are meeting. Daily they are, uh, you know, learning the word of God. They're learning about God. They're also going and preaching it to others. So, wow, what a community. Oh, what a community this is. So let's move on. Let's see what happens. Uh, so external issues. We saw one internal issues with Ananias and Sapphira. Now coming to... Uh, chapter 6 of the book of Acts says, Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, okay, so, wow, its church is still thriving. So, number of disciples is multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So, in the Jewish culture, they had this practice of uh, feeding the poor, feeding the um, the needy. The widows fall under the needy category. So that was a common practice. So when people became believers and they came into the church, you obviously had Jews who were Hebrew speaking. And there were also Jews because of their regional differences. There were some who were Greek speaking. So the Greek-speaking Jews are called as the Hellenists. Now, what happened in the church? In the church, all these ethnic groups are growing, you know, different communities are growing. Um, and they have noticed a discrepancy. What is that? There is a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. So the Greeks are saying, they are complaining, that our widows are being neglected in the daily distribution. So there is probably and we don't know if it was intentional, you know, like one community intentionally not giving to the widows of another community. We don't know that it was intentional, but sounds more like an administrative issue. We know that the numbers were multiplying. So maybe they did not have enough volunteers. Uh, resources, obviously, they, they seem to have had because people were giving. They brought it to the feet of the apostles, the feet of the apostles. So resources, they probably had. But distributing the resources was not efficient. So the Greek um, uh, people, Jews, are feeling uh, that we are being neglected. Now, again, we don't know if, if it was the way they took it. You know, sometimes they have it in their own minds, isn't it? Uh, that, uh, oh, we are being neglected. 
they were probably not being neglected intentionally. But there is an issue in the Church of Jerusalem. Food is not being distributed um, you know, impartially, equally to all the widows. So what to do now? Verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said so. What's happened now in the Church of Jerusalem? The apostles have gained a place of great honor among the believers. So there are the apostles, there are the disciples. So all the believers are known as disciples. So um, they call the disciples and they try to bring a solution for the problem. So they say, it is desirable that we should, uh, we, uh, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So the apostles are recognizing that they have too much work on their hands, which they cannot neglect and step into solving this problem. So they're saying we cannot leave the word of God, meaning, you know, doctrine related things like teaching, studying, um, understanding uh, the, the word of God. Why? Because they have this call on their lives to teach, preach. So how are they going to teach, preach if they don't invest that kind of time in the word? So that's what they're telling the people. Look, we're not able to leave the word of God and serve tables. So there is the pastoral you know or the teaching ministry we can't leave the teaching ministry to do uh, more of uh, like a service acts of service kind of a ministry okay so uh, but were they high and mighty were they saying that oh it's too small for us to serve people and uh, you know we won't do that uh, we know from their behavior and you know from the way the community of the early church was that they were not such men. So they sincerely were saying we are busy with spiritual matters of studying the word, ministering the word, and therefore uh, we are not able to take on this additional responsibility of looking into food distribution. Okay, so now what to do? the wisdom of God upon the leaders of the church that they choose to delegate the responsibility to others. Now, there's great wisdom in that. Imagine the apostles say, OK, we will teach the word. We will uh, serve. We will do the distribution. We will do the arrangements. We will do the member care. We will do the you know first time visitor calls. We will do. How much can they do? They will wear themselves out. and. They will not be in a position to do what God has called them to do well. So they recognize, OK, it's a time to grow our team. It's a time to uh, also help people find their calling. Maybe there are people in our uh, congregation whom God has called and equipped for this ministry, which is serving tables. So come on, let's do this. He Verse 3, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So they are saying, okay, disciples, how about we select uh, some volunteers? Okay, some volunteers. Now, what should be their qualification? Obviously, they should be equipped in the task, which is food distribution. They should, they should know how to do it. May I mean, prior experience would help. So basically, you know, you can imagine something like a, a, a you know, job description being given to the disciples. Said, so, okay, they should have practical skills to serve food, but something that is more important for a volunteer in the church is their spiritual qualification. Okay, what what is part of that? Good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So they are asking for spiritual men. And they're saying, even if it is a small task like serving tables, we want spiritual men. So look for spiritual men okay, um, who have a good testimony also. Such people, you introduce them to us. Okay, from the crowd, you would probably know who they are. Let us know. and. 
we may appoint over this business so they are leaders okay? they are leaders and they are uh, you know very keen on the health of the church the functioning of the church so they want to be very sure that they uh, have the right leaders in place so they take responsibility for that you tell us who these people are and we will appoint them over this ministry of food distribution and uh, while others can handle this matter was for but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So you see how important it is for people who are called in the apostolic, in the spiritual sort of uh, you know ministry areas, teaching, preaching. We have to invest time in the word of God. We have to invest time in prayer. So we cannot compromise on that and try to run God's ministry. It will not work. Okay, and we see that seriousness in the apostles of the early church that they were keen, they were trying to safeguard um, their time in the word, their time in prayer. So, everything else we do as ministry is over and above, and we must keep it that way. Okay, so they were committed to what God called them, and they uh, brought in other volunteers to serve in areas, uh, uh, you know, apart from the spiritual ministry so then verse 5 it says and uh, the saying please the whole multitude so you see how they are functioning together though they said that we will appoint these men people liked it they liked the idea so they were in unity in in of heart uh, and uh, they chose there's a list of uh, people they chose stephen a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So these men were brought, and they were commissioned. What is laid hands on them? So you see a, a, a practice in the early church of the leadership laying hands on the next line of leadership why they were praying they were commissioning you know they uh, like sort of um, before god before the people they were assigning these next line of leaders to their tasks and also we read in uh, what paul writes to timothy um, you know, i think it's the uh, first timothy 3 god so he writes and he says you know laying hands so the the deposit of the things of god in the leader it can be imparted to the next line of leadership by laying hands on them so uh, there is this practice we see in the in the early church of laying hands on the upcoming leaders while commissioning them so basically it's like a commissioning service they commission these people for what for serving tables, volunteers, uh, and verse 7, then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Okay, so uh, I'll just wrap it up uh, uh, with this statement. There was an issue in the church of Jerusalem and the apostles could have said, oh, you Greek speakers, you're too sensitive. Okay, nothing like this is happening. Just, you know, deal with it. Or, hey, this is a very small issue. Food distribution, we are sorry. We cannot look into food distribution. But when issues arise in the church family, it takes the wisdom of God to resolve those matters, however small they are. Okay. So this may have been a small matter, but you see how the apostles dealt with it. So you got to deal with it. And when they dealt with it, the beautiful verse that we just closed off with, verse 7, it says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So, so God has given the leadership responsibility to keep the work growing, and to keep the work going. And these leaders did it. Okay, And they did not um, you know, uh, let God's word stop because of a minor issue. And sometimes minor issues can become the major issue in a church being split or a, you know a ministry being stopped so that should never happen okay um, i'm going to close off with a word of prayer we don't have time 
to discuss. But uh, let's see if we can have some discussion in the next class, or please post on your uh, Google Classroom stream page. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, Lord, what you have, uh, Lord, recorded for us, Lord, from the lives of, uh, Lord, your, your people in the early days. Lord, we pray that uh, it will not just be uh, a story for us to hear and applaud, but, Lord, what you did back then, thank you that, Lord, we are still living in those times of the promise of the greater works. Help us, Lord, to walk in them and help us to be bold, help us to rejoice in the, in the mandate which you have given us, Lord. We bless and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you, class. Thank you for joining. Uh, God bless you. You can carry on to your next class. And uh, we'll stay connected. Okay? Please feel free to post on Google Classroom. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Wow. God bless. Thank you. God bless. Bye bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.